All right, uh, it's 1 p.m. on July 24th. We're officially calling uh, this meeting of the AIB to order. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded as public record, and that participation in the recorded meeting will be deemed as consent to be recorded, including statements both written and oral. Public records, including this recording, can be requested at any time in accordance with the Vermont Public Records Act. So welcome, everybody to AIB. We're going to do a quick round of introductions before we hop into our agenda. So I'm going to start with uh, people on the phone. So Claris. Hi there, this is Claris Cutler with uh, the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. Great. Yep, board member. Yeah, I'm doing board members first. So Clarice is a board member for us. Um, Ryan. Ryan Rebozo, representing the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Uh, Steve Schubert. Maybe he's not quite hooked up yet, but he's a member representing um, grass-fed livestock. Uh, Wendy Sue. I'm Wendy Sue Harper. I am a soil scientist and hold the soil biology position. Um, in the room. It's Steve again. Oh yeah, Steve, are you on audio now? Steve Schubert, you want to do a quick introduction? We are on mute. Apologies, guys. I'm a Google Meet guy. Uh, I'm Steve Schubert. I'm on the board and I'm um, representing grass based agriculture, I think, and meat. Thanks, Steve. Uh, in the room, we have our welcome, our new member, Anne. You want to do a quick introduction? Hi, uh, Anne Hazelrig. Uh, I'm an EVM, I'm a plant pathologist. Um, my Steve. Yes, Steve Bonnell, director of the farm division at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture Food and Markets. And I am a member of Morgan Griffith, um, also work for Agency of Agriculture Food and Markets. So now I'm going to go continue going around the room here. So we have. Hello, I'm Stephanie Smith with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and I'm a assistant director within the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division. Jill Koss, I am a member of the Agency of Ag Food and Markets. And Matt Wood, I'm with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. I'm a pesticide, tape seed, and fertilizer field agent. Okay, and our um we have a few people joining us. I'm just going to go down the list. So, um, Emily Bergeron. Yes, good afternoon. Emily Bergeron. I'm Vice President Chemistry with Crop Life Canada. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm butchering names. Uh, this one I can handle, John. <laughs> go ahead, John Tucker. Yeah, good You're afternoon. On. Yep, thank you. Uh, John Tucker, um, a professor of entomology and extension specialist at the Pennsylvania State University in the Department of Entomology. Thanks, John. Uh, Lewis, Robert, I know I'm saying that wrong, probably. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, all right. Good afternoon to all. I'm Louis Robert, and I'm a consulting agronomist now in Quebec uh, since uh, my retirement from the Ministry of Agriculture last year here in Quebec. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Brad Mitchell, right? Brad is your first, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Brad Mitchell. I'm with Syngenta. Thanks. And Lucas? 
Hi, all. Lucas Rhodes with NRDC. And Zach? Zach Schakowsky with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. All right. Thank you all. Um, we just a quick housekeeping. So we sent out the June uh, 26 meeting minutes. I didn't hear any uh, changes or suggested edits to those. Are we all okay with them from our members? I'm seeing a nod. I think Wendy, you already got back to me and said they look fine. I'm seeing that. All right. So those are good. Um, the agenda was up, but well, we don't need to put it up. But so we have four speakers for us today, well, three outside speakers. So we have on um, the introduce themselves. So Dr. John Tucker, Louis Robert, and Emily Bergeron, and uh, myself for Canadian um, overview. And so let's just do it because their time is precious. Oh, what are we, Amanda, oh, Amanda's, Amanda's in the queue. Thank you. Okay. Did you admit her? Yep, I just did. Amanda, can you hear us? Amanda, are you on? If you could. I am. I'm having a hard time with the sound. Sorry. Okay, that's. Uh, we can hear you great. If you could just introduce yourself, that'd be great as a member of AIB. Okay. Hi. Um, other than joining late, my apologies. Uh, Amanda St. Pierre, a dairy farmer in Berkshire. Thanks, Amanda. And I, and I had one other, um, Kim O'Brien. Could you do a quick introduction? Sure. Uh, Kimberly O'Brien, I'm with Bayer Crop Science, um, state uh, policy and advocacy based in Massachusetts and cover the Northeast. Thanks. All right. So I am going to pass the baton to Dr. Tooker for our first presentation of the afternoon. So John, you can share your screen if you'd like. Okay. Did that work? Can you see anything? We can see like a line of all your slides. Yep. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. I had to change some permission thing. Who knows? <clears throat> How's that? Perfect. Okay, perfect. I don't hear that every day. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, good afternoon again. Um, so uh, Morgan asked me to present to the group. Um, my research lab has studied um, the influence of neonics on ag systems um, since about 2010. Um, and I, my goal is to, to share some of that, those results, but also to provide an overview from kind of our perspective. Um, one of my goals is to not repeat um, what others might have said, but that's kind of hard to do, not having seen you know, the previous contributors' presentations. So, I don't know, onward we'll go. Um, Okay, so that nice looking uh, animal is a ground beetle. Ground beetles are central to what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I trust you admire the ground beetle. Okay, so um, my take home messages are here um, and I'll repeat um, them at the end. But management is 
kind of the paradigm for pest control. Uh, IPM focus on, focuses on controlling pests that are economically concerning. Um, much of current insecticide use, including neonic seed coatings, is insurance-based and not driven by IPM. Um, neonicotinoid use is rarely uh, risk-based, uh, but preventative uh, and to a large degree forced. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, Neonicotinoids, uh, from our research, disrupt many ecological functions and in some cases can exacerbate pests. Um, No-till agriculture combined with cover crops provides a great base for conservation farming and IPM. Um, and our research shows that if farmers adopt this approach, then the insecticides are even less necessary. And then importantly, progressive farmers will uh, embrace IPM uh, if they are shown the benefits. Okay. So um, why is that there? Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the goals I have today is to share um, details of integrated pest management, which is probably a concept that most of you have run across, but I think it's good to have most people on the same page. So uh, IPM is simply using a combination of tactics, biological, cultural, and chemical tactics to control pest populations. It's a pretty straightforward idea. But importantly, um, the insecticide should be the last resort. So IPM was introduced in 1959 by entomologists in California. And the main goal was to protect natural enemy populations, um, which would be allies in pest control. So if we can protect natural enemy populations, we don't need insecticides as much. The second key feature is that if we, um, if we implement IPM, we want to ensure profitability. So we're only going to use insecticides when we know that there will be a return on the investment of using the insecticide. So the key principles are to avoid preventative insecticides. Uh, uh, insecticides are only a last resort. Um, preventative insecticides are discussed uh, explicitly in the original description of IPM. Um, and it's um, acknowledged that it should be a rare case unless an insecticide is a perennial threat, um, a perennial economic threat to be more um, specific. Um, so we wanna to scout to know what pests are in our fields and then just treat the populations if they exceed what's called an economic threshold. The economic threshold is more or less the pest density or the amount of damage that a pest is doing that will yield, lead to yield loss. That's kind of uh, IPM 101. Um, most folks would get this in uh, undergrad or grad school, depending on their degree of choice. Okay. Current field crop production tends to avoid IPM and relies more on a preventative strategy. That is certainly the case of uh, corn. Uh, it's becoming more so in other crops like soybeans uh, and wheat. Um, but I certainly see insecticides as useful. I'd be uh, foolish um, to be in my position and, and, and not think so. Um, and I'm talking about insecticides broadly, but that includes leaf applied insecticides, soil applied insecticides and seed coatings. They are all useful, um, but they're only useful when they are used appropriately. Uh, since insecticides um, were broadly introduced um, to the uh, United States after and world really, after World War II, um, they have been, um, their use has increased steadily. Um, so their overuse has kind of been embedded uh, in their use. Um, and ever since they were introduced, uh, the, amount of, the amount of insecticides that's being used annually um, has gone up. And that's even with the pause um, that was imposed by the publishing of Silent Spring and the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency. There's been a steady increase in the amount of insecticides used in the United States every year. To reemphasize this point that most insecticides are not used via IPM, they're being used as insurance treatments. Um, and those insurance treatments um, can occasionally um, uh, stop pests uh, from doing damage, but more often um, they're decreasing the number of good insects out there, which can make pest populations worse, and then they're causing environmental concerns. Uh, I'm not gonna go much into the environmental concerns today, but I'll simply mention some of them in passing. Here's an example from a turf system. This is from a gentleman at um, Cornell named Kyle Wickings. Kyle is a soil, um, uh, soil entomologist, um, soil uh, ecologist. And this is a spider plot. And it shows the amount of uh, what we'd call ecological function um, 
based on these different axes when you have different amounts of insecticides in the system. And again, this is a turf system, not field crops. Um, so e e each axis has a, um, has a detail that we would like to be maximized in, um, in soil systems, whether it's a decomposer density, macro predator um, densities, predators more generally, decomposers, um, mycorrhizal uh, fungi colonization, and so on. You can see the, um, the largest area um, of a polygon is the green one. And that polygon is when we have no insecticides in the system. But then when we increase the amount of insecticides, the area changes. And it's not a straightforward uh, relationship, but you can see when we get to the highest application rate of an insecticide, and this is a pyrethroid, um, the amount of soil function we get decreases. So that polygon is the smallest, uh, indicating that the more insecticides we add, the ecological function tends to go down. Okay, so let's move more specifically to the neonicotinoids. Um, the neonicotinoid seed treatments or seed coatings, uh, as I usually call them, um, have benefits. One is that they're water soluble. So these things are coated on seeds. Uh, when the seed is put in the soil, capillary action pulls that water soluble insecticide out into the soil a little bit. And then when the first um, uh, root system starts to grow, they can be absorbed systemically by the plant. And that certainly provides um, a benefit in some cases. So these things can protect yield, um, but to protect yield, you need to have economically damaging pest population. And that is often not the case. Um, it appears to provide a targeted application because we're putting it right on the seed and then the, then the plant's gonna take it up. We're um, providing a, a low dose, um, relatively low dose of an insecticide that has relatively low um, mammalian toxicity and relatively low toxicity to other types of animals like spiders and mites. This low dose might be somewhat deceiving though, and I'll kind of get into that because the toxicity of the insecticides um, is really, really high. So this type of insecticide treatment can provide systemic activity of insect pests for two to three weeks um, after planting. And that two to three weeks has been verified um, by Christian Krupke at Purdue University, who has done a lot of extensive experiments harvesting plants after uh, uh, after planting and seeing when the insecticide is detectable. So we're protecting plants uh, when they're young and vulnerable by, by this approach. And this is the general idea. Um, and I was uh, lent this or given this slide by um, some, some colleagues in industry. Um, this is the general idea. So this insecticide coat on the seed is providing this kind of this sphere of protection around the seed and then the insecticide goes up into the plant providing even uh, further protection. So that's the general idea of, uh, of this seed coating. Uh, so let's think about the limitations of the seed coatings. Um, first one is similar to a, a strength, that, but it's only providing two to three weeks of protection. If we're growing uh, corn for hundred days or more, those two to three weeks are, are not everything, but they are something. Only one to 5% of active ingredient tends to enter the plant. Uh, there have been higher numbers reported in a crop like, um, like sunflowers, but uh, studies focused on soybeans and corn, uh, the amount of the seed coating that's actually getting to the plant is closer to one to 5%. So it's awfully low compared to the amount being uh, put in the environment. Oops. I'm not sure what to do here. Morgan, sorry about this. My screen seems to have frozen. That's good. We can see. Um, we went back to see like your whole, your, all your slides together. Yeah, um, you can maybe try and leave and come back, John, if that's possible.
now that I have questions. Oh. Can it, can everyone hear us on the call fine? Everyone else is okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now we can. Um, seeing if John can um, exit the call. Exit and come back. Um, I might give them just another minute and then maybe we'll just swap our agenda around. Yeah. Do we have a, can we text them? That's the number that I have is I can try and text it, but I'm not sure. Oh, she left now. Um, Yeah, we've had a whole series of presentations on you want to go back and look at the uh, our website. Oh, okay. We've had I don't know how many now. Yeah. A bunch. <laughs> Hey, John, I was just, oh, yeah. do you think you got it, or do you think, you want to give it one more I, try? I think I'm back. I switched computers. I'm not sure what the hell happened. Maybe Penn State didn't pay their bill this month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apologize for that, but that is technology. Okay, we deal with it too on our end. Yeah. <laughs> we have problems. Yeah. <laughs> Does that look normal? Yep, yep, yep. Actually, it does. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. Um, so, where were we? We were somewhere around here. Okay. So, I went through that. Um, okay. Um, as I, um, I would bet that you heard, um, I guess I can start at the top. But yeah, I was talking about only. Um, the coatings are only providing about two to three weeks of protection. Um, that's in part because so little of the insecticide coated on the seed actually goes into the plant. Uh, that's been per, uh, confirmed by Purdue University. And importantly, what we're seeing are very inconsistent yield benefits. Um, work from Canada um, and some folks on the call today probably know about this more than I do. And I think you were, um, I think you had Tracy Bowdy as a guest last time. Um, but only five to eight percent of the fields actually see, uh, see yield benefits. And those are from those Canadian data, um, but those production systems are very similar to what we have here in Pennsylvania, particularly in Western uh, Ontario. Um, and one of the bigger challenges here is the water solubility. So I listed water solubility as a benefit, but it's also a liability because sufficient rain can wash away the insecticides and certainly remove them from the root zone. Uh, polluting groundwater. Um, there's also a kind of a contradiction here. Even though they're water soluble, they can persist in soil. Um, to my understanding, this is 
perfectly well understood how this is happening. Think about staying in the soil water between soil particles. I need to talk to a soil physicist. But there is literature um, evidence that they can remain in the soil from seven to 7,000 days based on the active ingredients and the different soil types. Um, this is not my area of expertise, that's kind of literature based stuff. Um, and then they also limit uh, populations of beneficial insects. Um, our research focuses mainly on predators that occur in crop fields and not on pollinators, um, but we just acknowledge that pollinators are, are in the list here. Um, and I'll show you some research that we've done that um, they allow some pest populations to outbreak by limiting pest populations, okay? Some additional uh, limitations that they are, they're very good at what they're meant to do. Uh, so these are insecticides, they're meant to kill insects but they are among the most toxic insecticides that have ever been developed. Um, imid imidacloprid, for example, one of the seed coat, uh, one of the insecticides you can get on, coated on seeds and is the most um, widely used insecticide in the world. Um, imidacloprid is 10,000 times more toxic to insects than nicotine. Uh, and nicotine is a pretty toxic compound. If I wanna use nicotine in my research lab, I need to have special permission and get inspected um, about once a month. So they are also toxic to other groups of animals. This um, type of toxicity is not clear. Um, uh, some evidence came out in recent years showing that they're toxic to mammals via unexpected pathways. They're not doing what a typical nerve toxin would do. They're accumulating in spleen and genitals of deer, for example. Why that's happening uh, is unclear. Uh, and they are highly toxic to some birds and fish, but um, they are mild on some other birds and some other fish species. And the reasons for this variability is uh, unclear to my knowledge. Um, one of the more concerning details about neonicotinoids used as seed coatings is their um, use is not being tracked by the federal government, whether it's the um, Environmental Protection Agency, the USDA, or most state governments. Uh, this has led to a blind spot that we have very poor understanding of how much is being used uh, on the landscape uh, in the United States. Um, a former student of mine, Maggie Douglas, um, kind of did some work with the two um, databases that were available at the time, one from the U.S. Geological Survey and one from the USDA, and kind of cobbled together some information. I'll kind of share that with you now. These data are from one of the states that do um, keep track a little bit better than others. This is from the state of Minnesota showing the amount of neonicotinoids on the vertical axis and, the, and time on the horizontal axis. Um, and these are different uh, kind of categories of when, of where um, these types of insecticides are being used. Crop chemicals are in red, um, and then all the other categories are in different colors. You can see that neonicotinoids are dominated by being a crop chemical. We kind of know that, but there is this kind of um, dialogue going on in the world that farmers might be using neonicotinoids, but homeowners are too. Um, and maybe homeowners are contributing to say the neonicotinoids we can find in streams and rivers. Based on these data from Minnesota, it's clear that the crop chemicals, um, the crop chemical usage dominates. And I have no good reason to believe that say Connecticut, Vermont, Pennsylvania or wherever is significantly different than that of Minnesota. But again, very few states collect this information. Um, so Maggie's work has revealed um, or revealed a few years ago now that the amount of neonicotinoids being deployed on the landscape is going up considerably. So this is the amount of neonics on the vertical axis um, over time, starting at about uh, 19, uh, mid 1990s and going till 2011 in this figure. Um, 2011 were the most recent batch of data that Maggie had on hand when we published this paper in 2015. And the different colors are just different um, crop species or groups of crops. And you can see in 2004, the amount of, um, uh, the amount of neonics really started to increase. And that 2004 is when companies started to coat uh, imidacloprid and clothinidin on, on crop seeds, um, dominated by maize from the start. And then uh, soybean kicks in. This next figure shows the amount of change between 2011 to 2014. So that black line is 2011, and that's where the previous data slide stopped. And 2014 um, is the last, are the last data that we have access to from these two databases. What you can see from between 2011 and 2014 is actually a doubling of the amount that we estimate was deployed in the United States. And most of it is by seed coatings on corn and soybeans. 
But again, these data are not available any longer from the US Geological Survey. 2015 was the last year uh, and, um, between the US Geological Survey and the, and, uh, um, and the USDA. And these data are no longer explicitly being collected. So we have a total blind spot on how much is being used. But you can see no evidence that the adoption rate was tailing off. Indeed, it seems to be going up pretty steeply. Um, just to show you what this looks like, these maps I'm going to show you are for the U.S. Geological Survey Pesticide National Synthesis Project, which is easily found online. This is the amount of clothiandidin, which is the dominant chemical used on corn. And that's the amount shown in 2003, uh, used in 2003 across the United States, which is to say none. Uh, there's 2011, uh, and that's 2014. So what you can see is kind of a, uh, a, a broad expansion as these seed coatings um, were deployed across the United States. Um, and, um, neonics aren't that special, really, when it comes to the United States' capacity to use insecticides. Just as an aside here, here are two pyrethroids that are also increasing um, in kind of the amount that are being used. This is Lambdasphia halothrin, also known as Warrior, and then there are various generic versions of Warrior. So you can see the Midwest is blanketed in this stuff and good chunks of Vermont. And then this is bifenthrin. So, Lots of insecticides are being overused in the United States. It's not just a neonic thing, but you guys are curious about neonics. So I just say this as an aside that um, people are ignoring IPM all over the place and deploying these things kind of willy nilly, I would say on some level. Um, back to the neonics. So in my hands here in central Pennsylvania at our central Pennsylvania research farm, we see no yield benefit from neonic use. Um, these are uh, soybean yields on the left and corn yields on the right between an uncoated seed and a coated seed. Um, and we've done this years in a row and have never seen um, a yield advantage of using these. And I would believe that your, um, your conversation with Tracy Bowdy would have gotten in more depth on the Ontario data, which more or less show the same thing. One of the challenges of, of neonics is that when you put them in the ground, um, all the insecticide um, doesn't kind of stay right next to the seed. Uh, this is a figure we developed a few years ago. We're about 90% um, to 95% of the material coated on each seed doesn't go into the plant, but is lost to the environment. It either goes to adjacent streams, adjacent plantings, whether those be um, kind of herbaceous plantings or, um, or, or um, more natural areas, including forests. And just a little bit is taken up by the plant and actually benefits from controlling these insects that might be feeding below ground. Um, I don't have any personal research experience with the amount that's lost to dust, um, but that's mostly an issue where large planters that are being um, either pneumatic planters or vacuum planters um, are being used. Just to say that most of the material that's coated on seed does not go towards crop protection, but leaches into the environment. Okay, and now I'll talk a bit about some of the research that we've done here in Pennsylvania. Um, this is one of the first um, inklings of, uh, of data that we had that there was something interesting going on with neonics and slugs. So slugs are a significant pest in no-till. Um, I started on my job in 2008, and since 2008, they are the most significant pest that I get calls from by farmers. And slugs are an early season pest of corn and soybeans. Uh, they can also be a uh, kind of a fall pest of cover crops and, and uh, small grains. But these data are from corn. And the vertical axis shows the number of slugs per trap. And to trap slugs, we just put out um, white shingles. These are roofing shingles you might have on your home, but we cut them up and put them in, in crop fields and just tip them over every week and look what's underneath them. So that's the number of slugs per trap on the vertical axis. And this is just the corn growing season uh, the blue line shows the average number of slugs over that growing season where we had an uncoated seed, so no insecticide is in the system, and the red line is where we have the insecticide coated seed, so this is a neonic, um, this is actually clothiandidin on corn. And you can see on average over the growing season we have more slugs where we have the insecticide in the system compared to where we don't. So we looked at this, um, this, uh, this phenomenon a little bit more closely in soybeans, and I'll show you those soybeans data in a moment, but essentially the bottom line is that these neonic seed coatings are exacerbating slug problems. Uh, they're doing this by killing the predators that like to eat slugs, um, and that uh, allows the slugs to kind of feed unchecked, uh, decreasing crop stands and, and yield. 
So what we found in soybeans is that um, if you have more slugs, you have fewer soybean plants. That's not too surprising. Any farmer working in a no-till system can tell you that. Um, just to show you what I'm, um, to explain what I'm showing you here on the vertical axis, we have number of soybean plants per acre, um, more or less, that's per hectare, but you can think of it as acres if you'd like, and then number of slugs per trap on the horizontal axis. So as the number of slugs per trap goes up, the success of that soybean stand goes down. Um, importantly, there's a different effect if you have a neonicotinoid coated on the seed compared to where you don't. So the black dots are um, from the neonicotinoid treated fields. And you can see where we have the neonic, we have more slugs per trap and we have fewer soybeans per acre indicating that slugs do indeed um, eat soybeans, but they eat more soybeans in the presence of the insecticide. We've also been studying the things that like to eat slugs. Uh, these things are ground beetles, rove beetles, uh, some larvae of other beetles like uh, soldier beetles and even fireflies, which are a type of beetle. Uh, and this figure shows on the vertical axis predation. Uh, we show predation as the proportion of caterpillars being killed. Um, and we're using caterpillars here as a sentinel prey item. So in this lower picture, you can see a caterpillar, it's been pinned to the soil surface. Um, then we come back and we check on that caterpillar to see if anything has eaten it. Uh, this is cruel and unusual punishment, but because they're insects, we don't need a permit to do this. If this was a deer or some other type of uh, vertebrate, we'd get in a lot of trouble for doing this. Um, so we put the, these caterpillars out and these caterpillars are proxy for anything that would want to be eaten out there. Okay. And we can see that when we have more predators, the horizontal axis, there's number, there's number of slug predators per trap. Um, to trap slug predators, we use what are called pitfall traps. We put these little cups in the ground and, the, and these beetles um, will just kind of bumble into them and then we can go out and count them. So as the number of these slug predators goes up, the amount of predation on these sentinel prey item goes up. Uh, and that's a good thing. So the more predators we have, the fewer pests we'll have in a field. But again, notice the color of the dots. On average, where we have the insecticide coated on the seeds, that is the black dots, we have fewer slug predators and less predation, okay? So again, these caterpillars that we're pinning the ground are proxies. Uh, in our case, uh, they're proxies for slugs. We can't do this same, same type of experiment with slugs because they don't have exoskeletons. If you put a pin in the backside of a slug, it's gonna pull itself off the pin. It's kind of gross, but kind of cool all at the same time. And here's kind of the take home message. Um, this shows the number of slugs per trap on the vertical axis um, compared against predation on the horizontal axis. Again, that's the proportion killed. So the higher number, the better there. Um, so as predation goes up, the number of slugs come down. This shows us that those caterpillars pinned to the soil surface are indeed a good proxy for slugs because we're seeing fewer slugs under the trap when a lot of these caterpillars have been eaten. It also confirms that predators can provide a valuable service in crop fields. But because of the insecticides, when um, we have uh, slugs and predators and insecticides all in the same plots, so that's again, the black dots, we have less predation and more slugs per trap. All right, um, and this is the mechanism of this is that the slugs are feeding on plants. Um, those plants, if they have neonicotinoids in them, the insecticide is moving from the plant to the slug. Uh, but because the slug is a mollusk, um, not an insect, um, the insecticide has no effect on these slugs. And then when a predator comes along and bites one. Plant to the slug, to the predators, and that's enough to disrupt the predator community and will allow uh, the slugs to feed kind of more freely. In our soybean experiment, there were, we had 19% lower um, stand establishment uh, when we had insecticides and slugs together, and we had 5% lower yield when we had slugs and insecticides together. So it's not just an interesting ecological phenomenon that only academics are interested in, it actually has real repercussions for farmers. We're actually getting lower yield. Uh, we, had a, we did a similar experiment uh, with corn but uh, it was a really wet year and a couple of our plots flooded. So we haven't been able to publish a similar story with that because our data are more limited, but we were seeing a similar effect in corn, not surprisingly. Uh, beyond this influence of neonics on predators, we've also been studying the influence of neonics on other things. So we asked the question, do ne neonicotinoids limit decomposition? We did this in a three-year experiment, and this is relevant uh, 
because in no-till systems where you're not turning over the soil regularly, you have a lot of residue that will stick around. There's a typical soybean field in central Pennsylvania. Look at all that residue between um, the rows. Um, you want to make sure that you have enough decomposition so that residue goes away and doesn't accumulate year after year. In our experiment, we had a control treatment, then we had a neonic treatment, and then we had a pyrethroid treatment. Again, pyrethroids are just another type uh, of insecticide um, that are typically sprayed across fields rather than being coated on seeds. And this figure is just kind of the take home message at the end of a three year experiment, we found in the blue line, which is the control treatment, that decomposition occurs at this certain rate. And um, anything above the blue line shows something that's decomposing more slowly. So the vertical axis shows the amount of material remaining. So we put this type of uh, straw residue in these mesh bags. We, we know the amount that's there at the beginning. Uh, and then over time, it slowly degrades. So the blue line is decomposing faster. The red line and the yellow line are decomposing more slowly. The red line and the yellow line show um, a pyrethroid and a neonicotinoid treatment together. So they're both slowing down um, decomposition um, and they're doing it significantly so. So this is a 10% decrease in decomposition, which is a serious difference in decomposition. So it's 10% lower with neonicotinoids or pyrethroids, and that slower decomposition is being driven by having fewer decomposers. In particular, we find significantly fewer columbolins or springtails in our field. So the neonic neonics and the uh, pyrethroids in this case are limiting uh, pyreth uh, sorry are limiting springtail populations, and they're not contributing as much to decomposition. So decomposition is slower. We've also measured the influence of these seed coatings on uh, soil aggregate stability. Soil aggregate stability is an important measure of soil quality. So if you're a farmer, you would far prefer to have high or higher soil aggregate stability than lower uh, soil aggregate stability. On the left is what's called a water test, uh, where um, different types of soil are just suspended in water to see how quickly they break down. Um, a soil with high soil aggregate stability that has a lot of things kind of gluing and holding soil together will stay together in soil much, much longer. So that's what you see on the left in the A uh, container versus the B container. This is a no-till soil on the right. This is a tilled soil on the left. So no-till is a way to achieve higher soil quality and a higher soil aggregate stability. Uh, cover crops are a great way to help achieve higher soil aggregate stability, and that's what you can see in this figure. And this figure is from an experiment where we had an IPM treatment, a control treatment, and then a preventative pest management treatment where we deployed uh, neonicotinoid insecticide. You can see where we have a cover crop, the hatch bar, we have significantly higher soil aggregate stability than where we weren't using a cover crop. But concerningly, when we have our preventative pest management treatment in the mix, uh, we have significantly lower soil aggregate stability where we're using a cover crop. So something about the insecticides in the field, the neonics in particular, is decreasing our soil aggregate stability. Um, our evidence uh, thus far suggests that it has, again, had, the story has a lot to do with columbolins. So we're finding fewer columbolins in these preventative pest management plots, particularly um, where we have uh, the cover crop. We're not exactly sure why that is, um, but we're working on that uh, to clarify the story. So the bottom line for all these data I've just shared with you is that, um, uh, and, and I share this with farmers when I, uh, um, if I'm giving extension talks, is I encourage farmers to manage for the pests that you have and manage for your farming goals. These preventative insecticides, particularly neonics, can make pest populations worse. In Pennsylvania, again, most folks, uh, a lot of no-till farmers struggle with slugs. If slugs are your biggest problem, then you're making that population worse by using insecticides. And then you're disrupting this natural function. It includes pest control functions driven by these predators I've already discussed, decomposition, uh, soil aggregation. And those are the ones that only the ones we've measured. I'm sure there are others out there that we haven't gotten around to measuring. So to put a more positive spin on things, uh, our research has also shown that no-till makes conservation possible. So if, you do, if you're using no-till um, you're, you're and IPM, you're going to have fewer pests kind of from the start. If you, that's because these no-till habitats provide great, um, uh, these no-till fields, excuse me, provide stability for beneficial organisms, particularly the predators, and those predators can help with pest control. 
If you can go to the next step and add cover crops on that, that's gonna enhance these beneficial populations even further and better contribute to pest control. And what in effect you're doing is growing a small, simple food web in your fields where animals are eating animals, but those beneficial animals are protecting crops from, um, from the pest species. Uh, and just to provide one example of this, um, I've been working on this project since 2010. It's called the Penn State Diversified Dairy Cropping Systems Project. In this project, we have two types of rotation. We have a simple corn soybean rotation, and we're comparing that to two six-year rotations uh, where we're trying to grow all the food, fuel, and fiber that your average dairy farm needs um, to be sustainable. From an insect management perspective, we're using very different approaches. Uh, in the two-year corn soybean rotation, we're using uh, BT corn um, and, uh, uh, and we're using seed coatings on that BT corn and our soybeans, we're also using the seed coatings. And then shortly after planting, we're deploying a pyrethroid like many farmers in Pennsylvania do. Uh, in comparison, in the six-year rotations, we're using IPM. So my students and I, we uh, scout these fields um, every seven to 10 days. Uh, we measure pest populations if they're present. Um, and we compare those populations to economic threshold and we treat as necessary. So there's no BT in the corn that we're using in the system. We're not using seed coatings on the corn or the soybeans. And again, all insecticides that we deploy are being governed by IPM. Uh, and without going too bogged down in all the details, because I only have a limited amount of time here and I've already eaten up some of it by having a malfunction, uh, the pest populations have been worse where we're using the preventative uh, pest management approach. And that, um, uh, detail is supported by these data here. So on the vertical axis here, we have slug predators per trap per day um, across the two types of treatments, the high input treatment, which is the simplified corn soybean treatment, uh, and the low input treatment, which is the longer, more diversified rotations. And the panels show the first six year of this project. So year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, and year six. And for the first three years of the project, you can see the amount of predators in the two types of rotations was equal. But in year four, five, and six, and now onward, um, we see that there's significantly more predators in that low input rotation where we're using IPM. Uh, these, this pattern continues to today. I just need to get off my butt and write up the next paper. Um, and it results in this um, important relationship here. So slugs are the most significant pest in this system. On the vertical axis here, I'm showing you slug damage in terms of the proportion of plants that have damage. Um, and that's on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is early season predators um, in terms of number of predators per trap per day. And you can see as the predators go up, the amount of slug damage comes down, so much so that when you have a lot of predators are getting virtually no damage uh, to those plants. So if farmers farm in a certain way and use IPM, avoid these unnecessary preventative insecticides, you can grow your predator populations and they'll be your allies in pest control. So I work closely with a group in Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance um, and have kind of sold these guys on the idea of IPM. Uh, so in addition to um, soil health, which they're all farming for, which involves no-till, um, diverse rotations of the cover crop, they've added IPM and it's kind of central to their ethos. And this is a, the board members a, a few years ago and working close with these guys, they've really bought in. Um, and a lot of them are using uncoated seeds entirely. Uh, it's difficult for some of them to find uncoated seeds in the genetics they want. So they have um, perhaps only used the insecticide in the corn portion of their diverse rotation, but most of them are doing everything they can to get away from the seed coatings. Uh, and then they turn into advocates. So when I have a field day, I'll usually invite one of these gentlemen along um, because they can talk um, kind of more authentically uh, as a farmer um, next to a field where we've done what I'm talking about. And it um, really provides a nice kind of echoing of the message and kind of a reinforcing of the message that farmers will do this um, and then advocate for it. This, this gentleman is named Lucas Criswell. I've been, I believe he's been to Vermont to uh, discuss his farming successes. Okay, so I went too long. I'm sorry about that, uh, Morgan. Uh, just finished with the okay. okay. Just finished with the same starting uh, messages that I um, th that was on my second slide. So IPM is the paradigm for pest control. It focuses on pests that are economically concerning. Much of current insecticide use is uh, insurance based, particularly in field crops. 
um, most notably for corn. Uh, neonicotinoid use is rarely risk-based, um, is preventative and often forced uh, by the industry because there's a limited amount of uncoated seed out there. So a lot of times farmers are forced to use treated seed, even though they may not want it, need it, or even know they're using it. Um, neonicotinoids can disrupt many ecological functions, which I touched upon, and for slugs, they can exacerbate pests, and that's problematic for Pennsylvania because that's our most significant pest in no-till acreage. Um, as a positive, no-till and cover crops provide a nice base for conservation farming and for IPM, so if farmers will adopt this, in part by getting away from uh, neonics and other insecticides, they can have um, they can have success growing predator populations, and those predator populations will then help with pest control. And then our experience is preventative farmers like those in the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance will embrace IPM if someone shows them the benefits. But part of the challenge is that if it's only one extension guy showing them the benefits, it's hard for them to see. Okay, I'll shut up so you guys can ask a question and then we can move on with your agenda. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Th thank you very much for, for that. Uh, just have a one of the... Um, items of information I guess the board has heard a couple of times now is the difficulty in uh, scouting for and determining you know economic threshold levels for certain pests that we're concerned about like the seed corn maggot and wireworms. Do, do you scout for those pests and if so how do you do it what thresholds do you use? Um, yes uh, good question uh, we do um, we don't scout for them routinely um, uh, I have done projects um, kind of uh, in fields across Pennsylvania looking for wireworms and seed corn maggot. Um, and one particular experiment I uh, did over two years, I scouted eight fields in three counties. So that's 24 fields over two years. Uh, and these are no-till fields with cover crops. And I found one wireworm for my effort. Um, Seed corn maggot is more of a pest of tilled fields, particularly where you incorporate um, uh, the cover crop. So some type of green material you push underground. Um, and that's not something we do. So we have enough information to know where those types of pests tend to be problematic. Uh, and those pests don't tend to be problematic in no-till cover crop systems in Pennsylvania. So, um, if we saw kind of pest damage that we didn't know what it was, yeah, we would dig around and we would look and we would do an assessment to see if um, wireworm or seed corn maggot was the cause. But in our, um, let's see here, this is 2023, in our 13 years of running this diversified dairy cropping systems project, which is on a 12 acre field in central Pennsylvania, um, or 12 acre uh, spot of land, we have yet to see that problem. So in my experience, um, they're not uh, a primary concern. And by po most people's definitions, those two pest species are secondary pests, which means they are of secondary concern. Um, I know there are competing data from um, say New York state that show that they're more concerning um, from my colleague, Elson Shields. I have never seen that. What, so, sorry, a follow-up question, I guess. Um, so, in the IPM program that you're using in your diversified program, what pests are you scouting for? You know, what well, you so, um, we are the main ones that are problematic around us in corn and soybeans are uh, black cutworm uh, and true armyworm, um, but then slugs. So, those are the three big ones. Um, if again, if we were to see wilting plants that would be suggestive of wireworms, we would get in there uh, and, and dig around. But again, we've never seen that. So um, if you don't have some evidence that a pest is causing challenges, there's no reason to scout for it in my experience. Um, and then in soybeans, it's primarily um, a suite of generalist defoliators, things like Japanese beetles, uh, bean leaf beetles, um, some of the caterpillar species, uh, uh, and that's uh, so we're we're screening for kind of screening for the, that kind of suite of pests. Did I satisfy your curiosity, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have another question, but I wanted to see if anybody else had one before I chime in. Go ahead, Matt. Um, do you know uh, for your control plots 
especially with the, the yield difference for your control plots on land that had never seen neonic treated seeds before, you know, because of the persistence of the neonics and everything? Yep, that's, that's a great question. Yep, so um, our um, farm manager um, uh, is very well attuned to kind of the legacy effects of insecticide use. So um, the insecticides um, are kind of very poorly used on our, on our entomology farm. So we don't use insecticides unless we need them. Um, uh, so those experiments were done in fields that did not have a legacy of insecticide use. Um, and just between you guys and me, when, when I need to use an insecticide experiment, I go to an adjacent farm. Uh, say the agronomy farm or the plant pathology farm or something like that, where, where that type of use is more routine. We, we'd like to keep our, our entomology field as pristine as possible. Don't tell my colleagues. That, though. <laughs> um, my question is one that um, kind of stemmed from a conversation with Heather Darby last week, John, and um, we're toying with the idea around here because we've been hearing a lot about dust released when planting um, being uh, a major route of exposure, um, especially to pollinators. And so we've heard some things about modifying planters and to at least direct the dust so it doesn't just fly out undirected, right, where it can contact um, pollinator forages or pollinators themselves. Um, but and basically the most practical way to direct that dust is to direct it down straight to the ground. Um, so I wondered if you could speak to your reaction to that or your advice of, of kind of what you think might happen if that dust is directed down to the ground versus undirected at all. And right. Um, and can you see this figure, Morgan? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So this figure uh, accounts for that dust. Um, so two to three percent of the dust uh, of the neonics kind of leave as dust. Um, yeah, and I understand the inclination to put it on the ground because of pollinators, and pollinators are kind of charismatic animals that have gotten a lot of attention. Um, but by our research. The animals on the ground are, are probably, except for spiders, um, are going to suffer um, just as much as those pollinators might if it's gone undirected. Uh, so I would not be a fan of, um, of pushing the insecticide toward the ground because that is where your ground beetles live. And if your ground beetles and rove beetles and soldier, um, soldier beetle larvae and firefly larvae, if those things are providing a nice benefit for pest control, all you're doing is making their life more difficult by putting that insecticide toward the ground. Um, I'm not a, a agricultural equipment engineer as you might get, um, guess, um, but I would far prefer an alternative solution, whether it is to capture that stuff, um, try to figure out a way to um, have the planter not uh, vent as much. Um, uh, it, it is the case in Pennsylvania that the the percentage of farmers that have these newer type of planters that move seed around with air um, is increasing. Um, you'll probably see that um, if you're not seeing it already in Vermont. Um, and I find it super frustrating um, that these um, kind of the old school planters, they do a great job <laughs> planting a seed uh, without this challenge. So people assume they're I don't know, improving things with technology, but this is a step backwards if you're going to put the insecticide down on the ground. Thanks. Sure, no problem. Anything more today? I think we're good, if, unless anybody else on the line has a question for John. All right, thank you very much. John, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I'll uh, I'll probably stick around for a little bit, but I'll have to go eventually. Um, and I apologize for that uh, malfunction. I wish I could explain it. <laughs> no worries. Wrong. We did it. We're we're yeah. perfectly on time. We're fine. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, we are on to Lewis. Yeah. If it's possible to share my screen. Yeah. Um, it should be, there's like a square right next to the leave button in the upper right. It says share. It says share with a white box with an arrow pointing. Yeah, up. got it. Can you see the first slide? Not yet. An alternative is if you can email it to me and I can. Uh, I think it's working now. Okay. Do you see it now? We don't. Sorry. That's okay. So Monday all around for all, all of right. us. So we get it. Monday everywhere. Don't worry. <laughs> yep. I can see your screen now. Okay, now, how about that? Do you see it? No? What, we Gmail. Yeah, what we see is your Gmail. Close everything but your... Yeah, close everything but yeah. your... Right. <laughs> Are you back? I clicked on the wrong button, but again, it's not working. I one more. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm gonna email it to you. Yeah, you just gonna email it? Yeah.
don't see it yet. I just sent it to you. Oh, there you go. Oh, but I can't. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's, All right. All right. So that's how we'll uh, try to work it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's get started then. Uh, just a uh, first uh, warning. I'm not. I'm not speaking, of course, in on behalf of uh, the government of Quebec, uh, nor uh, uh, for the Ministry of Agriculture. But I've uh, I've worked. Uh, I've been uh, with the Department of Agriculture here in Quebec for 35 years until last year. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Some. Um, Background information. I have no control on that. You can can roll down the. Yeah, in uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Quebec is. Uh, we grow around one million acres of uh, each of corn and soybeans, six hundred thousand acres in small grains, uh, oats, barley, wheat, of course, and uh, much more in, in field crops and in vegetable crops. The total pesticide used uh, every year uh, runs around that uh, five tons of active ingredients per year, 74% in the agricultural sector. And <clears throat> in 1992, the Ministry of Agriculture, for which I was uh, employed, together with the Ministry of Environment and the Farmers Union, agreed upon a plan aiming at the reduction of 50% of the amount of pesticides used by 2000. But the plan uh, finally was a failure, it had no effect, and then it was resurrected uh, at least uh, two, uh, uh, on two other instances in 2011 and again in 2020, each time with uh, more humble objectives, but again, it uh, had no effect whatsoever on, a, on the uh, sales report of pesticides in Quebec. <clears throat> the conclusion of all that is that uh, incentives and extension don't work very efficiently if you were to reduce the amount of pesticide used, but really no one stopped and wondered why it didn't work. Next one, please. This is the uh, taken from the official sales report of the Department of uh, Environment in Quebec, the, with the latest year being uh, 2021, for all sectors uh, uh, combined. And you can see there's no 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 trend no trend whatsoever uh, of of a drop or decrease in the sale, uh, amount of pesticide sales uh, sold in Quebec. Uh, and if I add the uh, the, the uh, next uh, click, you will have the uh, the years where when uh, plans to reduce pesticides were being implemented. Again, uh, it's obvious that it had uh, uh, no effect at any of these uh, instances. Next slide. Now, for the ag sector, the farming farming sector, you can see that the. The solid line shows the amount of pesticides sold in the farming sector for the same period. And the uh, histograms show the amount of glyphosate being sold. Uh, and you can see that uh, glyphosate is uh, represent uh, approximately 50, 48, 50% of all pesticides being used in Quebec. Next one, please. Yeah, that's it. Uh, half of all pesticides being glyphosate. Next one. In the meantime, uh, <clears throat> monitoring by the Ministry of Envir Environment reported that pesticides were detected in most, if not all, streams and in increasing concentrations, especially neonics. 
and um, scientific evidence of the toxicity built stronger over the years. For example, our French researcher by the name of Jean-Marie Beaumatin reported that the toxicity of neonics for honeybee was that uh, was approximately, well, not approximately, but precisely 5,400 to 7,300 times that of DDT. And uh, in the meantime, the public concern grew stronger for environmental issue, but also public health issues. And some uh, illness are being related officially, recognized as uh, uh, work uh, illnesses related to the, the exposition to pesticides now, for example, Parkinson's disease. Uh, public funded research showed no benefit to farmers from the use of insecticide coated seed in 80 for 84 field crops trials and that was published finally published uh, three years after the work was completed it was published in 2020 uh, i remind you uh, notice here that uh, it's not only neonics but all insecticide next by the way you i'm pretty sure we'll have uh, some time for questions after i finish my talk because uh, I don't have too many slides, finally. Um, so in, in, uh, in the late 2010s, uh, starting 2015, 2016, the Department of en Environment started to let know to everybody that they, uh, of the intent of uh, reducing uh, by the adoption of bylaws, by passing bylaws at the National Assembly that they wanted to reduce the use of, uh, of pesticide using legislation. So they recognized five high-risk molecules or pesticides that presented high risk for uh, either or both health and, and the environment. Those pesticides were atrazine, chlorpyrifos, and the three neonics that you see in the table. For those pesticides, if a farmer would uh, uh, were to, uh, to use them, uh, he was required to produce a recommendation by a registered agronomist. There are approximately uh, 3,300 uh, registered agronomists in Quebec. Maybe a thousand of them would be uh, uh, competent or have the capacity to write such a recommendations, but there were very few of them, I can tell you that. Starting in the, uh, the bylaw went into effect in the spring of 2019. On the table, you can see that it had a, a very strong effect in terms of reduction since uh, uh, 2015 of the different pesticides, uh, atrazine 90% reduction, uh, for 66%, and the neonics were pretty much uh, vanished from the uh, um, from the use in 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 in, in the fields. In in 2015, pretty much all corn planted in Quebec were uh, was treated with neonic and 50, approximately 50% 50 of the soybeans were treated with uh, neonic. And in 2021, according to the uh, Department of Environment, it was less than 0.5% uh, of all corn and soybeans acreage that was treated with neonic. Next. What uh, add this uh, bylaw uh, what impacts had this bylaw on the on the crops and the farmers? That is a question that comes up very often. Well, after a few years of uh, now four years, yeah, four springs, we can we can see with confidence that we reported uh, no crop failures uh, to speak of, but uh, and no impact on yield either. Although some cases were brought up, uh, but after a close, uh, closer look and investigation by the agronomists, there were no cases of damages to seedlings, stand population, or yield that could be traced back to the absence of uh, uh, neonic. Most of the uh, redu reduction in, and there were only a few cases, the reduction of the stand, the population of plants per acre, could have been uh, due to uh, to uh, equipment malfunction or uh, uh, adjustment at uh, seeding debt that was not proper for the for the spring, so on and so forth. Regular things that happen every spring, really. 
but uh, some cases were investigated and uh, it could not be uh, traced back to, to the neonic. And uh, now a rapidly growing number of farmers are using insecticide free, not just uh, neonic, but uh, no insecticide at all uh, at seeding. And again, uh, no negative impacts uh, are reported so far. It is said that, uh, uh, mind you, I, I can't uh, present any official statistics on that because the, those uh, figures uh, come from uh, uh, unofficial uh, 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 inquiries with, with uh, seed dealers. But uh, com the comments that I hear is that in the spring of 2023, there were between 20 and 30% of the seed sales that were without insecticides in Quebec. And one uh, seed rep said that uh, as much as 35% of his uh, clients were no longer using insecticides. Okay, is there another? Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, the um, this uh, huge rapid uh, increase in, in the use of insecticide free seed can be linked to three factors. Uh, pressure coming from all around, public uh, pressure also, evidence of no harm being done if you don't use insecticide. And now the work being done by Geneviève Labrie, researcher at, here in Quebec, she's carried now over uh, over a thousand trials repeated with a scientific uh, setup and uh, statistical analysis done on each individual trial show that it 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 uh, it confirms what what she already uh, showed with the uh, network of 84 uh, farms that I was telling you about earlier is that it, it, the bottom line is that the, there was no uh, uh, effect on yield from not using uh, insecticide on the seed. And also another obvious incentive or factor was the, a, a grant of $12 per acre or approximately $30 per hectare from the crop insurance board for the customers not using insecticide. Uh, there, not all corn and soybean growers are, are insured in Quebec with the crop insurance board, but uh, I would say that the majority of them are. And uh, talking with uh, crop insurance officials, agronomists, and uh, managers, what were what they were telling me is that they don't they don't see uh, they don't see the need to pursue with that. So it will probably be be uh, left uh, away, uh, dropped uh, for the next season. They don't see the purpose of keeping that because more and more farmers are jumping in the. the the wagon and they're not, uh, they're no longer using insecticide, uh, no matter if uh, there's an incentive or not. Now the shortcomings or drawbacks, uh, uh, we saw an instant switch to other insecticides uh, as early as the first season in 2019, uh, moving from uh, neonics to diamides, despite evidence of the uselessness as well. Uh, and then uh, very soon after, diamonds were detected in most waterways of the corn growing areas of Quebec, and it was uh, widely reported in the media too. Uh, the diamides are proven to be less toxic uh, to honeybees, but they, they're much more toxic to butterflies and at aquatic life in general. And also we can we already saw that the sales, uh, global sales of pesticides kept up and uh, with the loss of trust, the uh, public outcry uh, from uh, all around, we can, we can feel it. You know, it, it's probably the case in Vermont, but here in Quebec, uh, the uh, pesticide related issues come up in the media pretty much every week now. So uh, whereas in uh, 10 years ago, we hardly, never ever uh, heard about pesticide in the general media. Now it's it's common to to read articles the era to even on, on the television to have a shows that are dealing documentaries talking about the risk associated with pesticides. And we feel the, the public pressure much more than 10 years ago. 
also, there are, it was already mentioned by uh, Dr. Tucker that uh, there, there are alternative methods, uh, namely the integrated pest, managements, uh, pest management uh, features, uh, for example, crop rotation. It, it's well known, but it's not very well uh, uh, diffused or uh, being communicated to the farmers, and they're widely overlooked, uh, really. And then the Ministry of Environment decided that it was a kind of a surprise, but uh, given the success that they had with the first uh, wave of restrictions on neonics, then they, they, they decided to broaden the, the, uh, the, uh, the pesticide code and to require a verification of need, the exact same thing as with neonics, but for all seed insecticides and fungicides to protect water and bees, of course. But it was a, it's a huge move and uh, everybody is anxious. Uh, mostly the, the reactions are positive, but it's going to make, uh, bring about a major change in the, in, the, uh, in the story here. And then, I, yeah, but uh, the question is if, if that's my personal comment, if I may, how come we must turn to legislation even when such toxic compounds show no benefit to farmers? Um, mainly for two reasons, I would say. The industry and the farmers' organizations interfered at the research level and also at the, at the farm uh, advisors level. And there are too few extension agronomists nowadays in Quebec. Uh, very, very few uh, agronomists are paid for, by the public to do the extension work, trying to bring the research results at the farm level. That is a major uh, lack that we have uh, here in Quebec. So those are, from my stand up, my standpoint, those are the two major reasons why uh, we have to turn to legislation, even, even when, it, when it doesn't make any sense to use them at the first place in uh, the farm level, you know, uh, farmers don't, no farmer want to, 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 uh, to damage, to, do harm to the environment or to their own uh, health, you know. Uh, so it's, it's just a matter of having the information available at the farm level and the scientific information, because it's been there for a while, as I said, uh, since 1992, we, we, it's obvious that we knew already at that time that pesticide pose risk to the environment and the, the health. And now we know also that they don't uh, offer, uh, in, ter uh, in terms of insecticides anyway, that they don't uh, provide uh, much benef benefit uh, in the um, uh, output, uh, the financial output of a, a farm operation. So we should just get rid of them. It sh we should have gotten rid, rid of them uh, earlier on, but you know, it's a matter of, uh, of trust and confidence and the, as I say, uh, interference and also the to, uh, to, to a few agronomists being in the field, out in the field. Okay, so the bottom line is that the legislation has limitations. The adoption of basic agronomic research results like IPA, Integrated Pest Management, could bring about a short-term reduction of more than 50% in the use of pesticides, at least in Quebec, because I, we, we were talking about the neonics and insecticides on the seed, but there are numerous Example, other examples of, uh, of uh, pesticide that were proven to be useless uh, in, for, in other crops, in other contexts, that we should uh, bring that information to the farmers and they would take, make the decision not to use uh, those pesticides anymore, unless there's some, at least some scouting. You know that uh, some damage is done at the, in the fields, in field crops anyway, in Quebec, uh, uh, result from the fact that uh, the, uh, the farmers were using uh, poor agronomic practices like uh, monoculture, monoculture of the lack of uh, rotation, uh, bring about a lot of, of uh, problems uh, at one point or another in the, in the process. So uh, it's, it's also a matter of, of implementing the right agronomic uh, practices. To me, that's very important. And we kind of forgotten about all that. 
But unless the extension system undergo major adjustments in Quebec again, we will rely on legislation. It's unfortunate, and I, I'm, I'm sad to say that, but that's, it seems to be the only way to go uh, in the short term anyway. As I say, I'm not very happy with that, but that's the way it is. All right, now I, I, I think I, I have time for a few questions, if you have any. Yeah, I'm just, I'm going to just stop sharing if that's right, just so I can see people again. Um, any questions? What, what was the, was the sound, I'm sorry, was the sound right? Did you hear well? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. it was perfect. Um, I have a question. Oh, somebody yeah, else said. Was that you? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, in your... I guess I was wondering, in your opinion, did the shift to using insecticide-free seeds come from, like, was it because it was too hard to get that, the recommendation from a certified agronomist, or was it because they realized that it wasn't needed? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, was it a, yeah. the red tape of the requirement or because yeah. they uh, it, that that would be a uh, very the case the uh, very true for for the switch from uh, neonics to diamides you know as soon as the first season after the in the, as the first spring following the adoption of the bylaw all seed in Quebec seemed to be treated with diamides all of a sudden, you know, it was kind of a miracle. But, you know, they, the, the seed companies had, had seen it coming because they were warned by the Department of Environment uh, three or four years prior to that, that it was coming. So it was very fast in, in switching. But the move from uh, diamides to no insecticide at all, that cannot be explained by, uh, by the uh, 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 by the uh, by the bylaw actually you know it's a it's a it's a result of a number of factor mainly the as i say uh, uh, we hear about the risk associated with pesticide and the honeybees decline collapse you know that the the problems they had they have with the the honey production with the collapse of uh, honey uh, of uh, honeybees so uh, it, it it's very sensitive to the public and in turn politicians are very sensitive to what the public is saying so it's uh, it moved uh, pretty much from there and uh, you know if uh, if there's a sufficient amount of of corn and soybean seed that are being used with no insecticide and, and everybody sees no damage no yield reduction whatsoever then you know it's uh, pretty much straightforward from then to uh, not using them. So that's why the increase is so fast. And again, you know, it's, it be, they, they, they see that the government is, uh, is ready to guarantee uh, $30 per hectare. If you're not using insecticide, it means that it's probably no risk to see that, to, to, to go that route. So a uh, number of factors have led to that, but we're not that, 100% yet, you know, and uh, I sometimes I, I try to imagine what uh, what it could be if uh, if we had a, a more uh, a stronger extension service because those uh, scientific facts were available for some time now, and it's very very uh, as I say uh, straightforward. We, we see across 84 site, different sites on farms, on commercial farms, we did not see any one of them with a yield increase following the use of uh, insecticide. So in, in agronomic terms, uh, if I look at my own experience, having research results so uh, uh, one-sided, it's, it's very hard not to not to adopt uh, the practice of not using insecticide. As I say, to me, it's just a matter of, of confidence, of trust, and uh, trying to get rid of the in interference that's being put in at the research center in Quebec, that was the case. So, uh, and that's 
you know there's a I, I feel that today in Quebec at least that there's a there's a, a big trend a major trend of reducing the pesticide despite the fact that we saw again an increase I see the pressure is so strong now that there's no other way but I'm afraid it might be too late for some of the damages that were done to the environment and public health also. There's an increasing number of, uh, of, of people uh, sick with uh, Parkinson now and other illnesses uh, that could be uh, related to the use uh, of, uh, of pesticides. The, uh, the issue of glyphosate residues all over the planet is, is is being uh, known for uh, to uh, many more people now than it used to be. That it has a huge impact on the public uh, perception of uh, agricultural practices. Farmers are being uh, are, are not very comfortable with all that, mind you, but others are just happy that it finally happens. And uh, some farmers have never used insecticide, uh, you know. So no one can say it, it's not feasible to do without insecticide because some have never used them and they're doing very well financially. Thanks. Uh, I think we have two more questions. Um, sorry. Um, I'll go to Steve first and then yeah. Claire, so I'll go to you after Steve. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so you had mentioned, I think, beginning uh, your talk that there were, you know, like 3,000 agronomists, certified agronomists working in Quebec, is that correct? Right. Yeah. So what is the, um, and then you made some comments about the extension. I'm just wondering what the sort of standard recommendation is to uh, to farmers in producing a corn crop or is there a standard or is there a big diversity in recommendations from agronomists on what to do about pest management in corn production yeah well i have to uh, uh pitch in some uh, background information in order for you to understand what's happened because uh, from out of the 3300 agronomists in quebec perhaps less than 200 are working for the public. I mean, uh, uh, the vast majority of agronomists nowadays in Quebec are paid by the uh, private sector, are working for the private sector. Not all of them, of course, are working for the pesticide industry, but uh, for those agronomists, uh, some of them are working in the animal sector. Some of them are working more in the nutritious nutrition aspect of, uh, of the old chain. But uh, as I said, approximately, I would say, uh, what, uh, 800 to 1,000 agronomists are working in the feed crop sector. And uh, so those, uh, those people would, be, would have the capacity to prepare a justification. Not all of them, but it was also shown very soon after the, the bylaw, I believe at the end of 2020, the Department of Environment issued a uh, statistics whereby it was it was shown that uh, it was proven that uh, most uh, justification or recommendation of pesticides were being done by uh, uh, agronomists hired by the pesticide industry so it made sense you know it, it was a confirmation a demonstration that uh, it there was a tie there was a there was a link between the amount of the pesticide being used and recommended and the uh, and the involvement of the uh, pesticide companies. That again is, is, a, is a feature that uh, helped uh, turn the table around and uh, put to some perspective on what's, happened, what's happening in the fields of the farmers. Uh, what about I, you? I'm not sure if I, if I answered well, right was, to your yeah. question. You're getting there. Um, in terms of the extension service, is there a standard set of recommendations for Corn production from the extension service. Uh, you know, it it won't. Uh, traditionally, uh, seed coating was uh, pretty much the way to go. We it was never put into question whether or not you should use a, a seed coating. 
it, it, it actually also you you probably know that it comes with the seed. You have no choice unless you put your your order in time by early December and advise your seed retailer that you want pesticide or insecticide free seed, then you won't have any. If you put your if you uh, order your seed by early December by the second week of December at the latest, you're pr pretty much certain that you'll get the seed that you you ordered. No no problem with that. But it's not it's never been a uh, how how would I put it? It's never been an official recommendation. Of, most of the time, it's it you know it's just a it's just a way to go. It's just a way to to grow corn, and there were a few exceptions where farm, for example, organic growers never used a uh, insecticide, and uh, they they relied upon uh, seed suppliers that were specialized in providing hybrids and and varieties with no pesticide on the seed that was in place already. But more and more farmers, uh, conventional farmers, uh, no non-organic farmers, were ordering seed that uh, had to be had to be with no insecticide, and more and more using uh, pesticide-free seed. And as I said uh, during my my talk, it's it's going to be implemented uh, by law in the in the province of Quebec as early, I believe, 2025 or 2026. Uh, there will be no more seed coated with any pesticide uh, in Quebec. I'm happy about that, but at the same time, it's just a, a demonstration, a, a proof of failure from our part because we couldn't get the, the scientific evidence uh, at the farm level and, and have, you know, our farmers uh, confidently use pesticide free seed. It's just unfortunate because it, it never made sense actually. And in the meantime, we've been used uh, very uh, broad damages to the environment. Thank you. Thanks, um, Claire. <clears throat> Hi there. Yeah, I have a question about um, untreated seed availability that may be just kind of a general question or thought, um, or maybe for you. but. Um, you know, I'm thinking about how we've heard from Heather Darby and Vermont farmers and uh, Corteva that it's pretty difficult for farms in Vermont to get um, non-treated seed or, you know, the certain genetic varieties that they want um, not treated. And um, you, you talked about this just a little bit um, just now, but um, it seems like in Canada, uh, maybe Ontario and uh, Quebec kind of have this right amount of the market share um, to, you know, with this legislation demand, um, you know, different options yeah. for the farmers. And I'm I'm wondering, you know, there's this new legislation in New York. It's kind of heavily caveated, but maybe that will, um, you know, start to chip away at this and you know allow folks to experiment uh with non-treated seeds if they if they wanted to um do you know the market share um that quebec and ontario hold in My, canada or are they different agrochemical companies or i don't know kind of rambling question i'll try to answer to, to the best i can but uh, i can tell you that there are more corn and soybeans in Quebec than in Vermont and more in Quebec than in New York, let's say. But uh, about uh, one tenth of what you would find in a state like Minnesota or Iowa. So it's not a big market for seed companies, you know. But I was, I was uh, as, uh, perhaps I already said that, but I was kind of surprised to see with uh, how, how easily farmers could, could get the untreated seed that they ordered. You know, we we have spoken to a number of field agronomists and uh, rep, sales rep, uh, and they they've, they didn't encounter a huge amount of problems with the you know uh, with the uh, uh, orders that were not uh, placed orderly, and they, they didn't the farmer didn't get the seed that he, he, he ordered, and uh, it was very. Uh, very nice to see that uh, we we didn't encounter so many problems. I was kind of surprised. They, as I said, the companies were, you know, they expect that uh, to happen. Uh, they they know that it's gonna it's gonna go that that way 
for sure. And uh, more, the Department of Agriculture in Quebec also add the dot like a, 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 we, when I was at MAPAC, at the Department of Agriculture, we used to publish every, in the, in the summertime, uh, a list of hybrids and, and soybean varieties that would be available uh, in the untreated format, untreated form, you know, in advance, prior to the uh, seed order season. So it, it kind of helped. And, and year after year, we saw more and more hybrids and more and more uh, uh, varieties from more and more brands being uh, available uh, untreated. And that, can, I think that uh, helped a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Louis. And I think um, we're just coming up on our time. So we just really appreciate you sharing um, your experiences in Quebec and your knowledge with us. Um, yes, thank so you. thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and Emily, you are up. If you want to share, if you have anything to share, you can. If it doesn't work out, mm. you can feel free to email us as well. It's fine. Okay, let me just try. I think. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think you should be. Uh, are you seeing my presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Make it so. full screen. Right. We can just see your like it's not in presentation mode yet. Yeah. This slideshow. Yeah. I will change that. Uh, what presenter? So you should be able to see it now. On uh, on full mode. Mm, no. Not not yet. No. Okay. Is it better now? It didn't change. Oh, because it changed on my screen. <laughs> so, okay. Let me maybe. I mean, we can. Yeah, we can see, can see it. Can see it. Fine. So okay. Can let, let, let's do it like that. I think it might be. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's, <laughs> we, uh, we haven't migrated to Teams yet, so as well as if we had the program. So sorry about that. But uh, thank you very much for the invitation today to, uh, to attend the, the meeting and, and present our perspective on provincial regulatory approaches to neonic seed treatment. Um, as uh, as uh, in the title and the request, I, I'm going to talk about what's going on in, in Ontario, which you heard about from uh, from various people, as well as in Quebec. Uh, Mr. Robert just presented uh, his perspective. So I'm really glad that, to be here today to present that. Um, so just before we uh, we start, I wanted to, to present who is Crop Life Canada. I'm the Vice President of Chemistry there, uh, representing uh, one of our business lines, which is dealing with uh, crop protection products. Uh, we as Crop Life Canada represent uh, Canadian developers, manufacturer, and distributors as pest uh, control product and also product of modern plant breeding, biotech, and gene editing. So you can see on the screen our, our membership, which represent a wide uh, varieties of, of companies that are present in, in Canada, either on the crop protection side or on the plant biotech side or both for, for many of them. Okay, Emily, hold on one second. So we're actually not seeing your slides progress. Okay. Um, um, just before you went too far. You can just scroll okay. down. Um, let me try again then. Okay, let's let's do that again. Because <laughs> they progress on my screen. So let's try that again, just to... Okay, sharing. Okay, do you see a presentation? Yes. So just try and okay. go, just try and switch slides to see if we'll, we see it go to the next slide. Yeah, maybe it's when it's yep. in full yeah. mode. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so if you keep it like that, then it works. Okay, so I'll keep it in not full screen. Uh, so if you have trouble to read, I'm, I'm sorry, I could maybe increase the font a little bit because uh, it seems to be when I move in full, in full screen that uh, the problem arise. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, Thanks. Okay. So uh, just before I, I start with talking about uh, Quebec and Ontario, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to to let you know how pesticides are regulated in Canada. Uh, obviously, we're a federation, really similar to the U.S. Uh, so the, the authority to regulate pesticide is uh, shared among uh, the different levels. 
So the federal is responsible for pesticide registration, marketing and, and labeling. Uh, who regulates pesticide in Canada is the Pest Management Regulatory Agency of Health Canada. Uh, provinces uh, are responsible for uh, cell use, storage, transportation, and disposal of pesticides that are registered uh, previously by the federal government. They also, if they wish, uh, have the ability or the power to restrict or ban any use of pesticide in their own territory. So uh, that's one of their power that they have. Uh, municipalities also have power to regulate pesticide. Uh, when they do so, it's about the use of pesticide. Many of them in Canada have elected to do so, especially in Quebec. Um, so I, before we get into uh, into the discussion on, on seed treatment, I think we've, we've heard a lot today, but I wanted to um, mention, and I think there's a presentation following me about what uh, how uh, these products, the neonics, have been extensively reviewed in Canada over the past five years. Uh, this is a listing of the final decisions, uh, the most recent one by the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. All of them, uh, if it's the risk to pollinators from exposure to neonics or a risk to aquatic invertebrates from exposure to uh, clocyanidin and thymotoxin, health environmental review, or the, uh, the final decision on potential risk to squash bees, uh, which is the latest one, all of them have reconfirmed the safety of the neonic seed treatment when used according to label. Uh, so that's why uh, seed treatment is still used in Canada. Uh, uh, and I have here corn, soybean, canola, among others, where uh, seed treatment is used in crop production. Um, so some of the benefits of the seed treatment, I know we've uh, kind of talked about that today on the other way, but I want to focus on, on where we feel uh, that uh, seed treatment is a part of uh, IPM strategy. Uh, so we feel that uh, there's strong benefit in protecting the plant when it's most at risk, uh, leading to healthier plant that can withstand more uh, negative pests or environmental stress uh, throughout the life cycle of the plant. Uh, the accurate placement of the seed in the seedbed really reduced risk uh, of exposure to both growers and non-target species. And, and the volume of product as to required to treat seed is less than what is used in, in foliar or soil application, contributing to reducing the pesticide loading uh, generally. So we feel that, uh, as opposed to some of the previous speakers, that they are part of a, an IPM strategy. And I think the Ontario regulation shows a way of how they could be part of a IPM assessment. So when we're talking about the Ontario regulation, uh, the Pesticide Act and the regulation is administered by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, I know that Paul Oxra from the uh, Ontario uh, Grain Growers uh, came in and speak to you about the changes that have been made in 2020 to the, uh, the regulations, which was well received by industry because the regulation as it stands today is uh, way less burdensome than, than it was before for, for growers in particular. So some, I'm not going through these changes again, but uh, they were all well received by industry at the time. Um, so the regulation in Ontario we're talking about, uh, it applies to soybean and corn seed uh, coated with neonics, one of the three products. Uh, it's for corn uh, used for uh, grain or silage and soybean for seed. And the requirements apply to uh, the purchase and the planting uh, of treated seed, but not the transport and storage, which the Quebec regulations apply to. So it's a more limited scope than, uh, than in the Quebec provinces. And then just for reference, I had the 2022 acreage of corn and soybean, just to give you a, an idea of how it compare and may compare to, uh, to Vermont production. So for the use of seed treatment, a uh, grower in Ontario needs to fill uh, certain requirements. Um, the first one is to complete the integra integrated pest management training, uh, which could be done online or uh, in person in one of the like university where it's provided across the provinces and with ve at very limited cost for the growers. The training needs to be completed only once and does not expire, which is an important point. And when the grower successfully completes the training, he receives a certification, which is important because he needs to, to have it to buy uh, treated seed later on. 
The second portion is about the, the grower needs to complete a risk assessment and a pest risk assessment report based on his risk assessment. Uh, there are three ways the grower can do uh, the risk assessment in Ontario. Uh, either he chooses to do the soil pest scouting, regular scouting uh, for insect damage or presence of grubs or worm worms at the farm. The other one is that uh, you can also elect to look at crop damage from past years. So uh, to kind of identify the, uh, the economic threshold there to confirm uh, uh, the loss in, in the stem loss, both in corn or so soybean and they have different threshold there. Uh, it's 15% for corn in stem loss and 30% for soybean. And these needs to be obviously have happened because of a pest. The last one, the last, way of doing the risk assessment is really through the rest, uh, the pest risk criteria, which we think has great value here. Uh, this is an assessment where you look at uh, what happened on the farm in a more, I would say, holistic way. So uh, you have to consider soil type, crop rotation, surrounding environment. So do you have tree lines around, pastures around, what is around your, your, your farm and your field? Uh, and agronomic practices, obviously, if you have a cover crop and tillage practices, if you're meeting one of the criteria, uh, then if you fill one of the criteria uh, in that uh, pest risk criteria, then uh, it shows that uh, it's legitimate for you to use seed treatments as part of your IPM strategy. Uh, what is interested here is the assessment needs to be completed only once. So it's not something that you renew every year. Uh, so it's less burdensome approach to uh, to growers. Uh, the last and the third requirement for grower is uh, is to sign an IPM written declaration stating that in making his decision to buy or uh, to use treated seed. When he, when he does all that, or she, uh, the grower gets the certificates from the uh, the training and assessment report from his risk assessment and the declaration, these three documents needs to be shown uh, to the retailer where he's going to buy the treated seed. Um, so what are the like considerations from uh, the, uh, the Ontario approach to regulating uh, treated seed? Um, so in our view, uh, best management practices that are not regulated, but are developed in collaboration with industry, agronomists, government would have been probably a better approach because we feel that it can, the Ontario regulation is really more, it's the best management practices, is how to consider treated seed as part of your IPM strategy and how to make informed decisions. So in our view, a non-regulatory approach that is developed in collaboration with the sector would have been a better approach uh, for Ontario, helping achieve the same objective uh, while mi minimizing uh, regulatory duplication of effort with the federal level. As I said earlier, uh, these products have been approved and deemed safe by the federal level, looking at value proportions and an impact on uh, workers, worker uh, and uh, non-target species and environment. So we feel that uh, in that case, uh, a non-regulatory approach would have been better. However, when considering some of the elements that are uh, interesting in the Ontario regulation is uh, first and foremost, the certification and assessment needs to be completed only once, which reduces the impact on resources, which is important. Growers don't have uh, a lot of time on their end. Uh, also, it recognizes the grower expertise and the ability to make informed decisions. This, in, this is keep growers know about what happened in, their, in, in his field and is best and the most informed to make those kind of decisions. And lastly, it recognizes the use of seed treatment as part or it integrates the use of seed treatment as part of an IPM strategy. So it, it, through education and training, shows growers how to use seed treatment as part of a more holistic IPM strategy which I think is very positive. Then to the Quebec regulation. Obviously it's a very, very different approach to what it is in Ontario today. Uh, I think he had a snapshot from Mr. Uh, Louis Robert just before, but um, so the Ministry of Environment is regulating pesticide in Quebec. Uh, so they're administering the Pesticide Act, uh, the Pesticide Management Code and the Certificate and Permits Regulation. Uh, the requirements that I'm going to talk about today that are related to neonic seed treatment in particular have been adopted in 2018. So it's uh, 
kind of the farming practice that it's, it's very recent. So uh, I know like uh, there are conclusions that could be drawn, but we're still in the, the midst of, of evaluating and assessing the impact on yield productivity uh, for the growers in particular. So it may be premature to draw a very strong conclusion of that. Uh, these requirements are uh, been adopted as part of a broader strategy on pesticide in Quebec, um, where uh, they are uh, uh, political uh, views on, on pesticide in Quebec, uh, public pressure, and uh, in response to that, uh, the government has adopted many uh, arbitrary pesticide reduction targets, which uh, we can see from the data that uh, hasn't been met yet, but there is a reason why they haven't been met, because sometimes arbitrary re reduction targets are not what you need uh, to inform farming and, and meet your goals. Obviously, these uh, should be informed by science rather than public pressure. So what they did in, in 2018 is they developed a new class or, uh, of pesticide or adopt a new class of pesticide, class 3A. Neonic C treatment is only part of the class. There are also chlorpyrifos, atrazine, and other, and also foliar application of the, neonic, the three neonic products. And for neonic treated seed, it applies to corn, uh, for corn seed, for grain and silage, sweet corn, soybean, canola, oat, wheat, and barley. So it's not just corn and soybean, it's, it's everything that is grown in Quebec. And just providing, again, the acreage here uh, to compare with Ontario. Obviously, it's way less in Ontario. I think the question was asked earlier as to is Quebec a huge market? No, <laughs> Quebec is a very small market in the Canadian market, which is already a small market for most of our members. So this is uh, something that I'll talk about a little bit later in terms of what to consider when developing best management practices. So Quebec requ uh, requirements for growers. So, so when the growers want to use seed treatment, uh, they need to get a uh, agronomic justification and prescription uh, provided by a certified agronomist. To do the prescription, there are templates and, and, and format already, but they need to do, the agronomist needs to do an assessment uh, an agronomic assessment, looking at the soil type, geographic region, where the grower is, the organic matter in the field that may impact the uh, uh, pest pressure, tillage practices, crop rotation, uh, and obviously pest presence. And pest presence leads to identified uh, the level of risk for each field. Uh, they are categorized in three categories, so low, moderate, or high. And only when uh, the level of risk is deemed high, so a certain number of, uh, of, uh, of insects in the scouting that the agronomist did, uh, will allow him to prescribe seed treatment. Um, and also, it is, um, it is a very narrow approach, really based on, on pest pressure and scouting, which is obviously it's not a perfect science. Um, so that's how they are uh, prescribing uh, seed treatment. So you need to meet a certain threshold. Um, I would say here that agronomists through their uh, order have been asked to really minimize the number of prescription and justification they're providing. Uh, and so an agronomist can know it, have more than 5% of his field that is covering uh, using seed treatment. So again, here we have another arbitrary uh, target uh, that are, is not, obviously not based on science. Uh, it's, it's rather uh, made there uh, to be able to meet some more uh, political goals that have been established. Uh, here in Quebec, uh, compared to Ontario, the justification and prescription is only valid for one year. Uh, and it's not valid for the entire farm, it's valid for parcels. So it, it has to be done parcel per parcel. Um, so it's only valid for one year, you need to renew it. Uh, and then um, the grower also need a certain permit and certificate. Uh, the certificate is, is need to apply the pesticide in the field, any pesticide, including a special permit to be able to plant treated seeds. And also it needs a, a permit to be able to buy pesticide, even with the justification prescription. So it's an added uh, requirement there. And there's a lot of uh, bookkeeping uh, in Quebec. It's a very European approach. Um, so growers are required to maintain a pesticide registry uh, where to keep uh, every information about the use of pesticide generally in their farm. So where have they used it? What type of pesticide for which reason? And the rec uh, all the record needs to be kept for five years. And the Ministry of Environment has the right to access those records for five years. So the growers have to keep them, maintain them so that they are accessible if the ministry wants to see that. Um, 
there's been a recent changes to uh, the code of pesticide and uh, the other regulation applying to pesticide where now the government has uh, adopted financial penalties for non-compliance including for growers who will not be following the system the many requirements today we're only focusing on those there are many many others requirements um and uh, these pe financial penalties varies between like uh, 250 dollars to 1.5 million so it's quite a wide range of uh, financial penalties. The last one, I put it there, it's not a grower obligation. It's that in, in Quebec, uh, there is a, a report that is published every year by the government as to reporting on the sale of pesticide. So the data has to come from somewhere. So wholesale and retailers have to report annually to the government by January 31st, I think, uh, the sale of their, their pesticide. That's how we know exactly what was sold in, in Quebec and for which purposes. So some of the data used in the pre by the previous speakers are, are coming from, from the report. So impact on growers. Um, so obviously uh, Quebec is the one where the, uh, the growers have to go through a lot more regulatory uh, requirements in order to be able to access a product that has been saved by the federal level. Uh, so it's an additional burden on growers that do not exist anywhere else uh, for products that they are, are deemed safe. So there is a, an impact on, on the ability for growers to use that. Since 2019, when actually the new requirements came into force, we saw a dramatic reduction of use of neonic seed treatment, uh, resulting, in our view, in less options for growers to address pest issue in their fields. And I know the question was asked as to why. Uh, why is that? Is that because uh, there was recognition that the growers do not need those? No. Um, the main reason is that there is a limited number of agronomists uh, that are willing to provide justification and prescription to growers to use these products. Uh, there are a limited number of agronomists. Uh, in 2023, I think the number is 700 agronomists who are working in the plant fields, so fertilizer and pesticide fields. And only a few of them are providing a prescription and just uh, They are not doing it because every time they did in the past, they were audited by their order, which really put a lot of pressure on agronomists, uh, as well as because the process is very burdensome. So a grower, even if he wants to have access to seed treatments, uh, neonic in particular, it is very complicated to find an agronomist who would want to even do the work uh, to prescribe it to you following the agronomist assessment. So that explained a lot. Um, obviously, uh, there's other products uh, on the market that have been replaced the use of, of neonic seed treatment uh, that are used widely right now. I think really, like, I know I, I saw some data uh, from the previous presenter. I'm not sure what my, like, the, Seed companies will agree with that. I think uh, I don't think we have the full data picture, uh, but it's not uh, many uh, growers have opted for keeping insecticide seed treatment moving to diamide, uh, seeing value in using it, and also uh, the offer. Uh, obviously, when when companies do not re receive the right signals, uh, they will no longer supply a market, especially when it's a small market like Quebec. So that works, it's true for seed treatment, it's true for, for every any single product. So, so that also had an impact. Um, the uh, Quebec regulation, obviously there's a lack of recognition of the grower ability to assess its field. Uh, everything is a reliance on a third party, which is a, a third party agronomist or a certified agronomist in this case. It has high impact on resources, both human and financial. And it is true for the growers because the agronomist services cost something. So he needs to pay for it. It takes time also to access the agronomist. So there is that. Uh, there's all the record keeping uh, that is quite burdensome, uh, but it's also very intensive for the government or really resource intensive. So there's a lot of cost associated with that, a lot of staff working on the oversight of that system, and also a lot of cost for uh, a, a huge impact on resource for, for agronomists themselves given the small numbers that we have working in the field to service all, all the farms that, that we have in Quebec. So when, when we're talking about uh, uh, developing best practices or an approach to, to deal with pesticide, I, I think Jerry speaking, 
um, lesson learned from both Ontario and Quebec from what we've seen worked and didn't work uh, to minimize impact on growers and I would say on the industry value chain is align with federal regulations as much as possible. Uh, ensuring that like tools that are registered at a federal level should be available for use by growers in, in all provinces in our case. Uh, approaches needs to be based and informed by science and science big data. Whatever the data are saying, when they are good value, it is very important. It is important for uh, communication with uh, sometimes the public that may have concern. I think uh, we government needs to be able, or government or industry needs to be able to defend practices, uh, but also to encourage compliance by growers and buy-in by growers. They respond really well to uh, measures that are put in place or practices that are adopted when there is a good scientific basis and data. Uh, predictability and transparency is key to inform commercial decisions by companies on, on product availability in a certain market and even new innovative tools that they will bring to the market that are not exactly related to what is might be regulated. Uh, when regulations make the market unpredictable or the signals are not the right one, a company may decide to opt out of a special market, especially when the market is small. And we've seen that in, in Quebec. Uh, Recognizing grower knowledge and expertise, I think I spoke to that already, it's key. Allowing for a timely response in the field. Uh, sometimes you don't have a week uh, to call an agronomist or him to come to your field and, and, and give you a prescription. You need to act very fast because uh, the pests are not going to wait for you. So you need to, to be nimble and, and allow for a timely response and consider the impact on, on human and financial resources for, for all parts, uh, all actors of the system. So maybe I would conclude in saying that uh, with pest pressure and environmental condition changing because of climate change, uh, and we've seen it quite heavily in the summer, I okay, can take to uh, talk to every farmer across North America and Europe as well for that matter, but in, in Quebec, we had a lot of water <laughs> and in, in Ontario as well, which makes really, really difficult growing season. The growers need all the tools to be able to adapt and continue to produce safe, abundant, and nutritious food and feed. So I think that's my last slide. So really happy to, uh, to take any questions you have. Thanks, Emily. Are there any questions? Just a comment. I mean, it must be really hard to have the different profits Provinces have different rules. I can understand how that's pretty tricky. Very and tricky. Do you think, yeah, do you think Ontario will go the way of Quebec or once they, no? They've, uh, they've done the reverse, actually. Uh, they were the first one to go with similar, something very similar to Quebec, and they realized that didn't work for, for their growers, for the agriculture competitiveness in the province. So. That's why they changed it in 2020 as part of a, an initiative to reduce red tape and uh, really came back with an approach that I think it's, uh, while not perfect, works way better uh, than the Quebec approach, which is quite burdensome. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, uh, any uh, <clears throat> impacts for the folks in Quebec, the farmers in Quebec on income or yield? as a result of the changes from the regulations that they know? We don't have a study that, to demonstrate that yet. So we're still working on that. Um, and this is something that uh, we're working with our members as well and with seed company in Quebec to try to, and growers as well, to try to document that. What was the impact? Uh, as I said, they moved to another product, an alternative product. So it's not like they all moved to non-treated seeds. Uh, so the impact might be milder in, in certain respects. What we've heard uh, on an anecdotal, but many, many times, is with uh, the no or conservation tillage and a cover crop. Uh, for those that have moved away from neonics, uh, now they're trying, they're they're uh, seeing more uh, of the uh, the insects in their field that will justify the need for neonic seed treatment. So we don't have the data yet, we're working on, on studies, and I know the seed, uh, the seed companies are working as well on that to try to get the data out in terms of what is the, uh, the impact. Thank you.
May I ask one what question to Emily? Sure. <laughs> you say that you, you don't have any data available comparing the yields of non-treated seed with treated seed. Is that because you find data by Serum and Geneviève Labrie to be, to be unreliable? Or is it because you don't, didn't see them? Because there are published results on that. It's not true to say that you don't have the, uh, the public has data in Quebec anyway, and it's published in plus one too. So you have uh, over a thousand sites. I mean, <laughs> just a fact checking here. It's, uh, it's not very true to say that there are no data available comparing the yields of, of fields, not only plots, but fields too with and without the exact same hybrid, exact same variety, even the exact same seed lots. So but, all but, factors being equal, but the fact that some is treated and other is not treated. <clears throat> but I'm not just, I'm just uh, you know, correcting something here that obviously is not true. There are a number of what data I said available. though, what, it's not what I said. Yes, you whatever we have data on yield loss. Uh, it's not now like as you you mentioned it as well. Like it's not that they the growers now have have uh, left uh, neonics to go to only non-treated seed. Many of them have opted for other alternatives. So what has been the change there? I don't think there's data. And for the data the of uh, Madame Labrie, there are questions there that have been asked, and we're still waiting for response about the applicability of the data and some methodology issue that we have with that data. So we are looking into that. We're working with the grain producer and with others to get the data straight to have a, a complete picture of, uh, of what it looks like now today. It's been published four years ago, I'm just saying. Yeah, I know. Oh, we don't agree. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Emily? Um, okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Emily, for um, okay, thank you for writing all that awesome information. To uh, okay. Um, thank so you. actually, and our presentation coming up is going to piggyback really nicely on that. I was afraid that I was going to uh, repeat a lot of things, so Emily set me up so nicely. Thank you. Um, so my. I have to think of what I'm doing. So basically what uh, we heard some members is to ask kind of on a federal level. So we've heard a lot uh, from now province specific and we've heard kind of a general overview and Emily just talked about the all of the scientific reviews that the federal government has done on Neonix. So we've gone through and uh, about the environmental impacts, and we've heard a little bit about the human health impacts through the risk assessments that EPA has done. So basically, Health Canada has done the same thing. I'm trying to put this in presentation mode. Okay. Um, so this presentation is just going a little bit further into what Health Canada's Pest Management Regulatory Agency, so the PMRA, has done um, in their risk assessments for neonics. So I've mentioned before in these meetings that I reached out to Health Canada and PMRA, and they pointed me to, so these are the two main websites. So there's one on neonics and one for pollinator protection, and their kind of whole story and overview is on these two websites. So I did my best to summarize this information for the AIB today, and I got the presentation slides fact-checked by the PMRA. So they gave me the seal of approval to talk to you guys today. Um, but so these, I'll put these websites up um, when this goes up with the meeting materials as well. So basically, it started so they start to kind of tell the background which we've heard a little bit and it started in 2012 uh, so they really started to look at and start these scientific reviews of neonics in response to reports of bee kills in 2012 and so they instigated studies to determine risks to pollinators um, from exposure to neonics and then 
they started extensive Munich water monitoring. And then the PMRA published decisions on risk to pollinators and then on risk to aquatic invertebrates for the three main neonicators that we are always talking about, clothinidin, cyanothoxam, and imidacloprid. So starting in that 2012 uh, seasons and then for two growing seasons in a row, there was a high incidence of bee deaths that were reported. And uh, when neonic-treated corn and or soybean seeds were planted, so they, upon investigation, they could tie those deaths to exposure to the dust that was generated during the planting. So Health Canada's response in 2014 was to introduce a new requirement to limit the release of that dust. And then, so since that requirement, the incidents have decreased and they remain low. So the requirement that they introduced to reduce the dust, the dust was included banning the use of talc and graphite. And so they only allow the use of a dust reducing fluency agent. So also included in the requirement was to avoid loading or cleaning the planting equipment near bee colonies or forage areas. Uh, avoid engaging the system, starting the system when the dust could contact bee colonies, and then the spilled or exposed seeds and the dust had to be incorporated into the soil or cleaned up from the soil surface. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how did they regulate the use of fluency agents? What was the mechanism? I think that's a great question. <laughs> um, and I want to write it down. Um, so I, I'm seeing. Does anybody have a call now? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if anybody, uh, Emily, if you know or list of how they regulated the, the fluency agent. Fluency, using only fluency agent and not just talc and graphite. I will have to look. I don't have the uh, the answer in top of my head. Can you repeat the question, please? The question was how how is it regulated? So it's communicated that the requirement prohibited the use of talc and graphite in planting. In, during planting, and we wanted to know how that was, like how compliance was determined with that, or how yeah, was it regulated? Yeah. How do they regulate the use? The question is, how did they, for the farmer, how did they prevent the farmer from using talc or graphite when they were planting the seed? Because that's not a pesticide per se. It no, be. it's that's true. It's not a pesticide, but uh, it, news can spread around pretty easily. You know, uh, it's a it's a risk assessment issue from my point of view. Anyway, it's a. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, there are only a few number of uh, few uh, retailers uh, selling those products too, so it can be traced back rather easily too. But I, I'm not saying that it it, it just uh, it's still being used from time to time. That I know, but uh, you know it's uh, it's not being implemented uh, very strictly. Let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. Um, so, in addition, when they published this as two separate documents, so one was the requirements when planting treated uh, corn or soybean seed, and then they also published uh, protecting pollinators when using treated seed best management practices. Um, so, within these BMPs, they have that, that requirement of only using um, fluency agent and not talc and graphite in a separate box, but then also included in these best management practices um, for protection of pollinators uh, is using IPM when choosing the seed treatment and uh, really asking for communication, improved communication among growers and beekeepers. And then, so continuing more of these BMPs 
include uh, recognizing and avoiding pollinator habitat, like weeds and flowering trees, uh, avoiding dust exposure, so by not planting on very dry or windy conditions when the flowering resources or standing water or bee yards are downwind. Avoid generating the I, dust when... Go ahead. If I might, I, I, I can add something, uh, Morgan. It's just uh, I just realized that the, in Quebec, uh, Neonics have disappeared pretty much, you know. So the the question doesn't hold. Uh, it's it's not it's not valid anymore because it's, they're not being used in in Quebec. There are so few examples of uh, agronomic justification. There's no need to to uh, you know to whether or not we should be careful about those ma best management practices when using neonics when in fact we're not using them at all or you know less than 0.5 percent of the acreage. Yeah, makes see sense. what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Um, so more of these um, best management practices that were issued by Health Canada is uh, calls out generating, avoid generating dust, also just when handling and loading the treated seed from the bags. Uh, also clean and maintain your planting equipment regularly, but in a way that the wash water or the, the vacuumed dust that's generated during cleaning doesn't cause any non-target exposures. And then also dispose of the empty seed bags properly and to report any suspect pollinator pesticide poisoning. So then um, this is what Emily was talking about. So the PMRA conducted pollinator specific reevaluations of imidacloprid, clofianidin, and thiamethoxam and published them in 2019. And then all of the label amendments that were required in those uh, reevaluations had to be implemented by April 21. So for the imidacloprid pollinator reevaluation decision, it resulted in cancellation of some foliar and soil application uses, as well as some restrictions to applications to crops before or during bloom. And then additional label statements were proposed for the use of neonic seed treatments on cereal and legume crops. Similarly, for clothianin, the reevaluation decision canceled some foliar application uses and limited others and uh, that additional label statements were proposed for use as seed treatment on cereal crops. And lastly, uh, the same general mitigation measures came out of the thiamethoxam reevaluation decision, as well as cancellation of some uses and the additional label statements for seed treatment. So I tried to find uh, an example of the seed tag required language that resulted from these reevaluation decisions. So on the left, uh, you have the Canadian label for Gaucho 480 insecticide, and it lists the required information that must be on all the bags containing treated seed. And then in comparison on the right is the United States EPA um, approved label for Gaucho 480. So the Canadian label includes these um, mandatory statements. So additionally, all treated corn seed for sale for use in Canada must be labeled with the following information. And then these bullet po points, I know it's a little small, so I'll just read them. Um, Imidacloprid is toxic to bees. Dust generated during planting of treated seed may be harmful to bees and other pollinators. To help minimize the dust generated during planting, refer to the complete guidance pollinator protection and responsible use of treated seed best management practices that we just summarized a little on the Health Canada webpage and it gives a link. When using a seed flow lubricant with this treated seed, only a dust reducing fluency agent is permitted. Talc and graphite are not permitted to be used as a seed flow lubricant for corn seed treated with this insecticide. Carefully follow use instructions for the seed flow lubricant. Do not load or clean planting equipment near bee colonies. Avoid places where they may be foraging. When turning on the planter, avoid engaging the system where emitted dust may contact honeybee colonies and spill their exposed seed and dust must be incorporated into the soil or cleaned up from the soil surface. 
So those bullets, this label is saying those bullets have to be on the treated corn seed label. On the United States side, um, we have, it says treated seed, uh must be labeled in accordance with all applicable requirements of the federal seed act so that's what's in the box um same as health canada has that um also that just says treated with either the brand name or the commonly accepted chemical name and don't use for food feed or oil purposes but it does have um on here it says labels for commercially treated seed must include the following addition to the environmental hazard statement and that is exposed treated seed may be hazardous to birds dispose of all excess treated seed and seed packaging by burial away from bodies of water cover or incorporate spilled treated seeds so that's just trying to show a comparison of the different labels of what they're requiring what the requiring to put on then a treated seed bag So the question that Steve had about how the fluency agent is enforced is because it's on the label, and presumably if you use those products, then you're in. No, it's on the treated seed. Right, it's on the treated. I don't know if it's the. Well, this is this is right. This is on the label of Gaucho. Oh, is it? What this is showing. Okay. What I copied here was just what they're saying had to be put on the seed label. It gets real interesting. Oh, right, exactly. So I, I don't <laughs> know. Where's the seed label? Yeah, right. right. We don't know. All right. right. Okay. Sorry. That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So in addition to the reevaluations that assess the risk to pollinators, Health Canada conducted special reviews assessing the risk to aquatic invertebrates for clothianidin and thiamethoxan. So they reviewed environmental data, water, water monitoring data, and then in from those reviews in August 2018, they published a proposed special review decision that proposed cancellation of all agricultural uses. After that proposed decision uh, was published, they received large amounts of Munich water monitoring data, and they had a stakeholder forum to examine the use of Munich in agriculture. And so Health Canada considered the extensive comments they received and the additional information they received, and they published the special review's final decision for Clothianidin and Thiamoxoxam in March of 2021. And so these are kind of the summaries of those decisions. So, <clears throat> When they were assessing the potential risk to aquatic invertebrates, they assessed clothianidin applied as seed treatment or foliar or soil treatment. Uh, so the resulting mitigation measures included cancellation of inferro application on potato and seed treatment for field sown leafy vegetables and bunching onion. Uh, the measures also reduce the maximum seed treatment rate for field corn and reduce the yearly maximum rate per hectare, which limits the planting rates on various vegetables. And then, so that rate reduction for seed treatment of field corn resulted in the cancellation for the use of clothianidin for corn rootworm as a seed treatment because it needed that higher rate for efficacy. And there are also some foliar application relevant mitigation requirements. So similarly for thiamethoxam, some uses were canceled and the maximum seed treatment rate for field corn and soybean was reduced, which means uses as seed treatment for some select pests were canceled in these crops. And there's also mitigation measures relevant to soil drench, inferro, and foliar applications. And I'm not doing all of these, but it's there for us to have in our, um, to refer back to all the mitigation measures. 
So right now, Health Canada is working on the health, environmental, and value assessment reevaluations of clofianidin and thiamethoxam. And those will be more encompassing than just the pollinator and aquatic invertebrate specific ones that we just talked about. And so they're expected in 2023 sometime, um, but they did publish this um, health, environmental, and value assessment for imidacloprid in May 2021. And the, let's see, the human health risks associated with imidacloprid are considered to be acceptable when used according to revised label instructions. And environmentally, the reevaluation identified risks of exposure to aquatic invertebrates, uh, birds, and mammals. And so the risk mitigation measures and label updates had to be implemented. So this is for imidacloprid by May 2023. And then the canceled imidacloprid products will be phased out. Oh, that's funny. That doesn't like to go to this slide. Um, so, the risk mitigation measures that were published in this reevaluation decision included these uh, canceled uses due to risks to the environment. The only seed treatment relevant one being the cancellation of use as a seed treatment for corn flea beetle on field and sweet corn. And so imidacloprid risk mitigation measures for human health included some PPE and engineering controls for seed treatment uses. And I don't have an elaboration on that, but that is a question for me to follow up also with PMRA. But um, and then label updates for uh, restricted entry intervals and drift precautions. So the mitigation measures for the environment included reduction in maximum seed treatment rate for field corn, sweet corn, soybean, and select vegetables. So the labels um, for these mitigation measures, the labels are required to have standard statements informing users of the potential toxic effects to sensitive biota and identify spray buffer zones. Um, and finally, there are additional restrictions for use of treated seed, including revisions to the seed disposal instructions and the prohibition of broadcast seeding of treated seed. Um, so that basically summarizes the information that's provided on Neonex at a federal level for Canada. Um, I do have contacts and, and we have also um, some contacts on the call with us today that are Canadian based um, that we can reach out to for questions that I might not be able to answer, but I'll try. All right. So I will go back to, I do think Steve, I'll um, see if I can, I'll ask him about. Um, regulation of using calcium yeah, graphite. Yeah, how they actually enforce it. Yes. And don't see any questions. Okay. Sorry, I was just trying to get back to that screen thing. Okay. So I think what we have next is kind of just our work plan and what our next are. Um, I will say, I don't have the work plan up, but I can get it up. Um, I do have one more speaker lined up for our August meeting, and that is Scott McCart from Cornell, who is one of the authors of the extensive Cornell Neonix report that we heard a lot about last month. Um, and so he's in Australia, so it was just hard to coordinate. So he's gonna 
come in and be at the end of our meeting just because it's time difference that's what works so he's going to have like the three to four slot for our august meeting 28th. yeah august 28th thank you um but other so other than that what we have and i don't know of the members that are on the call is anybody planning on going to the field days with heather darby on thursday I know that we wanted to maybe get in. Okay. Laura is going. Thank you. This um, is Steve. I'm planning on going. Oh, great, Steve. I know you had talked about it. That's great. I, this let me just uh, uh, for folks if, if you can go it'd be uh, we're going to hear about the research that heather's doing on this particular topic uh neonicotinoid tree of seeds so um uh, you may recall that we talked about early on you know several months ago we're we're actually partially sponsoring the research sponsored by epa and us on neonicotinoid tree of seeds in vermont so it's extremely what we're doing. So it'd be um, good to hear from Heather herself how that research is going and what they're finding. Mm -hmm. um, and then so just to tie up work plan, um, we also have, I know it kind of didn't really fall through the cracks, but it's been waiting patiently. Uh, we did do that round two of the ag input survey. And so we have those results from that round two of trying to disseminate it. Um, and so we'll try and summarize those. I didn't even look at whether we got a big response or not. I don't. Yeah, we didn't get that many additional yeah. responses. Um, but so we'll summarize those next month as well but so the i think the chunk of what we expect um, members to kind of be prepared to talk about is is what we want to do right so of what we're tasked to do and that is um kind of under here so you know we need to make a recommendation to the agency of ag of adopting, you know, whether we adopt by rule BMPs for the use in the state of new nitrogen seeds. So uh, we need to address these topics. We tried to cover these topics. Um, I know we had, I think, Steve, you had talked to me after last month, um, and I haven't gotten with um, Sarah Owen, an AIB member, to just revisit the human health mm -hmm. impact so i know that that's outstanding and that was has been communicated so that is one thing that i think of these topics that we maybe haven't heard as much as we want to on yet mm -hmm. so i think i guess the the charge to aib members in preparation for august would be to be prepared to talk about what we want to do yeah, and also sort of recap. What might be useful sure. is to do a recap of what we've heard so far, just to sort of bring everybody sure. up to speed relative to these topics. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we have these topics and we've heard presentations and gotten information on each of these topics and just sort of where we're at. And then just have sort of a general discussion about where, you know, how to move forward. We also need to recap the, um, or go back over the sort of the decision making process we adopted months ago. Sort of, you know, reiterate. I don't think, I mean, unless somebody has some really great ideas in August, I don't think we're going to be ready to actually start kicking around BFTs yet. But, mm. um, but I think we can sort of tee it up, you know, for um, some discussions in September and October. Um, and for, for folks, you know, I'd really encourage everyone to, as much as possible, participate going forward because this, this is where the 
the sort of the real work will start is um, with what we're doing over the next several meetings. Um, so I just also wanted to make an opportunity already for public comment. Um, so if anybody would, if there's any comments from the public that have joined us today. Okay. Okay, well, thanks to all our, the folks who made presentations today. Valuable information for the board to consider, take into account. And uh, as always, if you have any questions between now and the next meeting, reach out to Morgan. Morgan is the keeper of all the knowledge. Huh. <laughs> I need to make myself a hat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next month. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Boy, we covered a lot of ground. Yeah, so I need.